we're going to I have to be conscious of that and, and try and get through our, our items as quickly as possible to accommodate that. So uh, with that said, uh, we'll jump into public comment. Do we have anybody signed up for public comment? Nope. Okay. Uh, next up is the number one, which is presentation discussion and possible recommendation on BPUB's financial performance report for a period ending September 30th of 2022. Just as a reminder, uh, we don't have any members of the public here, but as a reminder, our fiscal year uh, goes October 1 through September 30. So at this point, we're reviewing um, the performance for fiscal year 2022. Good afternoon, um, Mr. Chair, members of the, of the committee. Morning, kickoff officers, Director of Finance. We will be looking at, at the income statement at the far right column, the year to date numbers. And we see that we had sales and service charges of 191 million for 59.49. Fuel collections of 66 million, 206, 211. Fuel under billings of 30 million, 915, 480,000. Less the rate stabilization of 15 million, 400,000. And utility service to the city of Brownsville of 5,512,302 gives us total operating revenues of $267,660,338. From this, we subtract our total operating expenses of $215,313,244, leaves us operating income of 52,347,094. We then have our non operating expenses. Um, our net non-operating expenses of $26,052,534 leaves us income before capital contributions of $26,294,560. Our capital con contributions of $8,145,966 gives us a change in net position of $34,440,526. When added to the net position at the beginning of the year of $411,306,272, Gives us a net position at the end of the year of 445,746,798. And Monica, just um, uh, uh, confirm uh, for the benefit of, of anybody who's listening uh, of that change in net position, um, 30.9 million um, is in the form of a receivable due to the underbilling. Underbilling, correct. correct. Okay. And these are unaudited numbers. Yep. Um, moving on to our flow of funds, we see um, that we did, if you look at line 20, we see that we su generated sufficient revenue um, to give us a balance available for transfers out of $50,680,622. From this, we uh, transferred out $13,581,220 to our operating sub-account for the fuel adjustment, the improvement fund capital funding of $7,389,389 and some commercial paper defeasance, scheduled commercial paper defeasance of 1,333,332 for total transfers of 22,303,941. Left us improvement fund surplus for the end of the year of 28,376,681. And again, these are still unaudited numbers. Okay. And so that's the financials. Um, just a quick note on the COB, uh, Transfer, Monica, yes, the, the total, including the um, their utilities, will, is how much? So they had a cash transfer net of their usage of 12,155,04. Their usage was 5 million. My apologies. 5.5? Yes, 5 million. Okay. So 17.5 would be the, the total COB transfer? Yes, which is 10% of the adjusted gross revenues that you see on line 12. Okay. I just wanted to. I just wanted to. Confirm yes. that. Thank you. And that's that was it for the financials. If there's any other questions, you covered mine. Okay. Joseph, any anything for Monica? Uh, no, just a quick note. Can you um, yeah, and and it's pretty obvious, but in case anybody is watching, explain why the last bit of numbers aren't um audited just yet. Um, our fiscal year ended September 30th, 2022. We currently have our external auditors uh, from Burton, McCumber, and LaGuardia auditing the numbers, and we expect to have that um, finished by the end of the fiscal year, by the end of the calendar year. Excuse me. Yes, and this is standard, and it happens every year, just like yes, this. Yes, correct. Yep. Thank you. 
Thank you. All right, thank you, Monica. Next up is the presentation discussion and possible recommendation on year to date uh, CapEx as of uh, end of fiscal year. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is George on Hill and I am the uh, finance manager here at PUB and I'm going to be providing an update to the year to date capital expenditures uh, as of September 30th, 2022. And so I'm going to be concentrating on columns E, F and H. Uh, and if you see here, it is go, it is divided by utility. And so I'm going to start with the electric utility on line number 5. On column E, the approved plan for fiscal year 2022 was 28,773,495. Which year to date we have expenditures of 12 million six hundred and fifty uh, forty eight, uh, giving us a completion percentage of 44% on the utility side. Moving down to general and administration, the approved plan for fiscal year 2022 was 4 million 285,896. Uh, a year to date actual completion of 1 million 697 388, giving us a 39.6% completion. Moving on to the water, we had a approved plan fiscal year 2022 of 31,564,838 uh, with year to date um, expenses of 8,306,918, giving us a completion ratio of 26%. On the next page, wastewater for the approved plan fiscal year 2022, we had 29,745,089. Uh, year to date expenses are at 6,976,183, giving us a complete uh, percentage of 23.5%. And then facilities at 3,800,254 uh, 3, for the approved plan for 2022. Uh, year to date expenses are at 1,015,693, giving us a completion uh, percentage of 26.7. So overall, the plan for fiscal year 2022 was approved at 98,169,572. Year to date expenses, we have 30,646,230, uh, giving us a completion percentages of 31.2% 31, 31 overall as of September 30th, 2022. Great. Thanks, George. Um, are you aware of, I mean, clearly, you know, we had 98 budgeted, we, we spent 30. Of, of that remaining 67, um, have we reviewed to see if there are any critical items um, left in there that we need to prioritize in this fiscal year so as to make sure that we don't have any of our, we're not putting any of our systems at risk or any of our uh, our customers at risk? Yes, so before our budget for 2023 was approved, we did meet with several of the directors along with the executive team. Uh, we did go over each of the projects that still had uh, money left over to make sure that whatever needed to be done in 2023 was captured in the, in the new budget as well. Okay. Yes. Any questions? From yeah, I just want to quick comment with George. I mean, George, this is something we've talked about in the past for some reason. I mean, we're getting at a 31.2 completion rate. Mm -hmm. Y'all must be working overtime to try to figure out how to uh, get to the end of the road of these projects. The money that's left over is being pushed into the next uh, budget. Yes, uh, so whatever, we're, that, not everything, but there were projects that we knew that we were still continuing. And so that's what our carryover is. And that's got, that got included into our 2023 budget uh, to make sure that those projects that need to be done, get done throughout the year. Yeah, you, can you uh, recall one item that is extremely under completion? Uh, that comes to your mind or something where you're getting closer to completion? Um, no, this yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. But that, you know what, that may be something, I don't know when the next facilities meeting is, yeah. uh, but that may be something that can be reviewed and discussed at the facilities meeting, just so that they're aware and the, the board is aware of, of any items that are, um, you know, perhaps falling behind okay. that, that need to be prioritized. Yeah, I'm sure you're sure. looking at this and you're concerned about it, but I yes. think the board needs to understand what projects are really out of reach, what projects are 50%, what projects are getting close to completion. Okay, yeah, sure. We can get information in the future. Yeah, we can provide a listing. Okay, great. Joseph, you got any questions for, for George? I mean, I, I kind of um, will pile on. I, I think that's a great idea. Um, Art and, and Patricia, I think, suggesting that's great. If we could, uh, if there are any projects also that have been on this list for more than 
a year, more than two years, you know, I mean, it, it would just be nice to kind of have that trend and, and um, know how long things have been hanging out. Cause I know we had a 30, this was a 30 something completion rate. I know last year, I think was a 40 something completion rate, percent completion rate. And just, uh, just again, so we don't accidentally have something um, break that shouldn't break. Sure, we can provide a timeline as well. And, and for the committee members, just just uh, to know, so you guys know, in our board or committee meeting packet, um, they did include the line item breakdown. Um, so Joseph, if you want to take a dive into that, or Art, same thing. Um, we do have, uh, you know, by utility, uh, every line item with every amount uh, yeah. to see how the math adds up. So if you guys have some time, um, maybe you can take a dive into that and and put it on the agenda for the next facilities meeting. Any other All questions? Right, or? No, that's it on my end. Thank you. Great job, thanks. Thank you. Number three is the presentation and discussion by external auditor uh, BML on progress update for BPUB's fiscal year 2022 audit. Yeah, yes. Uh, uh, Mr. Ben Pena, uh, audit, uh, partner with uh, Burton McCumber and Longoria, we provide an update. Ben, good afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you for having us. Um, our auditors began last week, so we are in the middle of it. We are in the thick of, of our testing and our, all of our analyses and documentation of, of, of everything that we need to with respect to our audit. So everything has been going well. Uh, we've been, been getting very good cooperation from management, so there are no issues there. So. Um, very little to report other than we just started and we're in the thick of it. And so as, as time progresses, we will be uh, providing a little bit more, more substance in our, in our report, but overall it's going well. Okay. Um, Ben, I, I know we, we discussed a, a couple of recommendations, um, that, um, uh, came out of that, the, the CRI, uh, uh audit. Um, is that something that you can touch upon uh, now, or do you want to sure. hold off and, until um, further down the agenda? Items? Until yeah, the the other agenda item. It probably makes sense to discuss it in conjunction with the other agenda item okay. since it's all related. All right. So, uh, we'll, but certainly we can come back up. Okay. Well, if if we can do that, then we'll Sounds just good. we'll call you back up uh, when we get to number six. Then. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Any questions from Joseph or, or from Art regarding the the audit? Okay. I'm good. Number four is presentation discussion and possible recommendation on selection of a plan administrator for the irrevocable trust of BPUB's uh, OPEB plan. It's okay. Is that Monica? Okay. Hi, Monica. So in uh, August of 2022, the board did approve the establishment of an OPEB trust. And so just to give you a little bit of a, a background, so the OPEB, we do provide post-retirement post health care benefits and supplemental death benefits to our employees, to our retirees. And per GASB 75, we, it, it allows for the establishment of an OPEB trust to fund those future payments. We're uh, required to recognize the full OPEB liability in our financial statements. And so by creating the trust, that does reduce that liability. In September of 22, as of the end of fiscal 21, our OPEB liability was 22.6 million. And with rising healthcare costs and aging workforce, this liability is expected to grow. So our initial contribution into the trust of 13.3 million. Um, and any future contributions will reduce that financial statement liability significantly. And the trust also provides assurance that funds will be available and that the invested funds will should outpace healthcare inflation and the investment income can be used to offset expenses. So as I said, in August 2022, the board did approve the establishment of an irre irrevocable trust for the pre-funding of OPEB and authorized the RFP process to seek a plan administrator. So we did uh, issue the RFP, RFP in October. We advertised it in the Brownsville Herald. It was sent to 12 firms. We had four firms that responded. We had a review committee of, of staff from various divisions uh, in the company that reviewed the proposals and evaluated them. 
And we have come up with a recommendation from the committee based on the four applicants, the four proposals that were received. The committee is recommending the selection of PARS, public agency retirement services, at an estimated annual cost of 39600 to 68874 depending on the investment advisor or manager utilized. Mm -hmm. We did uh, provide you all hard copies of the firm profiles of the four the firms that responded to our proposals um, and the rating chart on how the committee ranked the, the four respondents. So we are presenting this to you today, and then our next step is to take it to the board on November the 14th. We have it on the agenda for the November 14th. Um, the firm that we selected was the most responsive. They had the most relevant experience in the particular uh, need that we have for the establishment of the OPEF Trust. Some of the other respondents had very limited information or the experience that they provided was not related to the OPEP Trust. They had a, a good amount of experience, but in other areas not related specifically to the OPEP Trust. So this particular vendor that we're selecting, PARS, had the most relevant experience pertinent to what we're, we're looking for. Okay. Um, Mike, I, I noticed that um, we have two options on the investment advisor and uh, manager. Mm -hmm. um, Vanguard, I, I recognize that I believe they're one of uh, you know the two or three largest asset managers yes. globally. Um, Highmark, I, I'm not familiar with U.S. Bank. I, it's part of U.S. Bank, right? Um, but th there is there is a a fourfold options. yeah difference. Is there any reason uh, why um, staff would be recommending one over the other? Um, um, we we need to do a little more. You know, once we get into the into the contract with them and, and some more discussions on that, but okay, I think Vanguard Vanguard certainly would more than meet our needs for the yep. investment portion of the okay okay the investments. Um, and as far as uh, PARS is uh, concerned, um, do we are there any you know credit rating requirements or is there any additional due diligence that we need to do on our end? Um, regarding their, you know, financials and uh, their... The firms did all present their financials. Okay. Um, they also included the financials for Vanguard and for U.S. Bank in their packet, okay. in their proposal. And so, yes, everybody... You're comfortable with that? Yes. Okay. Um, we also asked questions about litigation, any pending litigation that they're involved in. And so they all responded appropriately to that as well and, and disposed anything that, that they've got. But, yeah, okay. there's no concerns with the... the financial health or strength of PARs or, or any litigation that they're involved with. All right. Um, any questions for Monica re regarding that recommendation um, and or anything related with this item? Uh, I have some notes here for, for, for uh, to ask questions about the criteria, but given the proposal rating chart, so I understand that. Uh, on the cost, Monica? Yes. As y'all narrow it down, Talking about a cost just for the uh, manager to uh, manage the uh, the funds. Uh, There's no other the, any other secret cost hidden <laughs> fees. No, um, some of the proposals did not were not fully responsive as, as far as they had a fee for the management, but not for the investment right. part part of it. And so there is some uh, where we don't know the full cost, but in in the case of ours. They did disclose the full costs. So they'll take our investment, our initial investment, and they will, of course, work at the best of their ability Correct. for a certain management cost. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Joseph, any questions? Uh, one question, one comment. So, first of all, thank you very much for this breakdown of um, um, your selection criteria, and, and really, this this is very beneficial. Thank you. Um, now, my question is: Will we uh, be able to set? The, I'm, I'm sure we will, but just to ask, set the risk profile for this. I mean, um, will we have any input into that? How how do they make these decisions? Yes, we should. Um, we. Probably we'll have to establish an investment committee and internal. Yeah, we, we can probably set up uh, quarterly meetings with the uh, the administrator to make those decisions concurrently. So, okay. Monica, will they be here next? The next meeting, representative. 
Uh, we, we're not going to bring them in for, for really. in person interviews. If you'd like us to, no, we can. no, no. Their, their rep is in Austin. And if we, if you'd like them to be here on Monday, we can. No, it's not necessary. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that. Okay. All right. Right. Now we do have an, an item at, uh, for the Monday's board meeting. Uh, the recommended recommended action is going to be uh, given by the finance committee. Okay. I, I mean, I think given given the comments, um, I don't I don't think there there's any objection to to recommending part. Ours and uh, with Vanguard. With Vanguard. The, uh, yeah. all right. Thank you all. All right. Thank you, Monica. Um, next up is the. Um, Estrella, right? Yes. yes. Presentation, discussion, possible recommendation for approval of BPUB's group health and dental uh, partially self-funded plans and rates. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the board. My name is Estrella Solorzano, Acting Director of Communication and Administrative Services. Um, I'm going to present the group plan and rates. On October 10th, we came to the board to authorize uh, BPUB to negotiate a contract with Blue Cross Blue Shield as a selected vendor for, for group health and dental. Uh, just real quick, as a little bit of a background, the uh, policy year is January to December, so it's in a full calendar year, not in a fiscal year. It is a partially self-insured plan because we do have the stop loss uh, insurance at 200,000. Our insurance consultant is with the an associate. Um, again, the, the board approved on, um, as I said, on October 10th. And we have had presentations internally. We normally do this on a yearly basis. We present the recommended rates that we're bringing or any increases or changes to premium to internal employees. We bring it to the board at, um, um, either on an individual basis or in a committee meeting such as this, and then uh, bring it to the board meeting based on your feedback. Um, as you can see, I did add a note there for the health fund balance and the dental fund balance. This is money that has been um, placed in a health fund and a dental fund to cover for unexpected uh, claims or increases that we don't that we don't know in, uh, because they're just projections. So uh, for for policy year 2023, we are recommending no benefits, uh, no benefit changes to the health uh, insurance program, as well as no increase in rates uh, for the group health and dental. We are making changes to the benefits or recommending changes to the benefits that would be uh, improvements increasing the maximum to th from 3,000 to 4,000 and removing the waiting period for the endodontic, excuse me, periodontal crowns, inlays, and overlays. That would include no changes in rates. Uh, we do have a very healthy fund, um, and I have provided an analysis in your packet on how we came to, to, to being able to recommend no changes in rates or no changes in premiums to the employees as well as the benefit improvements with no changes in rates to the dental. This is what the uh, rates would be for employees for 2023. They are the same as the 2022 rates, which are included in your packet. It is important to note that these are for, for employee health, um, for employee retirees health as well. There are no changes. COBRA is based on the Blue Cross Blue Shield recommended rates times a one point uh, times a two percent administration fee. Uh, that's the maximum that we can that we can charge, and that's the way that we do it. So they'll see a difference because we base it on their rates. So um, that's the presentation that I have. I will be coming to the board um, uh, on Monday to to request your approval for open enroll for the GM to to select the open dates for enrollment and for approval. Uh, for, for this plan. Any questions on the packet that I submitted to you with the analysis or anything to that extent? No, not on my end today. I was very, the information was um, obviously very uh, complete um, and I, I have no, no no objection to your recommendation. Thank you, sir. I mean, it's good news that you have uh, no visits, no changes in rates. Correct. That's Thanks. excellent. I just wanted to make a comment as to that. Do yes, you all promote to your employees uh, wellness? Do you, uh, do you provide, do you all provide any uh, support for nutrition and for exercise and wellness, generally speaking, for all PUB employees? Well, the, the Blue Cross Blue Shield plan has a wellness page and they actually even have discounts. Uh, they even have discounts on some of the gyms that are here. Internally, I don't believe that we've done that um, recently, correct? Um, because I don't think that we've done that. What, what HR is currently doing, 
um, which is a great thing. Prior to enrollment, they are bringing in the vendors to talk about what's available through through their benefits. Um, and that's happening started November 7th through whenever the board uh, allows us to select the dates for open enrollment. So that's very good, but that's something that we can discuss internally to begin to implement. We used to have it in the past. I think it's important that uh, the perhaps BB can uh, distribute or inform employees on wellness, on nutrition, and other things. Just to provide. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, and just uh, just like I said, there are changes to COBRA, but, but that's because COBRA is for employees that have left. They're not retirees. For the dental, it's for dental retirees and for COBRA. Again, that's based on the Blue Cross Blue Shield rates, which are actually lower than the employees uh, in most instances. In this particular case, yes, well. Okay. Any questions? Joseph, you have Mr. Hellman? There we go. I had to figure out the unmute. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much for this presentation. I guess just to pile on to what Art said is um, at MIT, I think twice a year we do this kind of steps competition where, you know, you try to log more steps than the other team. But, yeah, it's not important right now. I just was thinking about it when Art was talking. So um, we, we have a few options for cool things to do, but wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And yes, thank you for the feedback. Um, we'll bring bring ideas. Thank Thanks. Thanks, Isaiah. Great job. Next up is number six, uh, presentation and discussion of proposed uses of fees, rates, and other funds collected to support the now terminated Tenasca project, including proposed uses and or distribution of the Tenasca equity fund. Um, Mike, I know your name's on it. Uh, I'll, I'll step in. Um, and then give you an opportunity to just, yeah, just real quick. Uh, I really don't have an update uh, for this other than maybe we can have uh, at this point, I guess, have Ben uh, come up here and then and, uh, talk about any recommendations uh, from that CRI examination report. And I know uh, staff has been working on some data requests or getting, gathering some data for the committee yeah. to, to uh, continue their efforts. Yeah, and to add to that, I'd like to um, thank uh, staff. Uh, for their uh, their help on this item, I, I mean we've I've I've been um, participating as well, and they've been taking a deep dive into the um, fees, rates, and other funds collected portion of of that uh, item, uh, which is really getting an understanding of the, you know the the last ten years uh, of um, of consumption and, and contribution you know, into this pool. Um, we, the, we have active accounts and we have inactive accounts. I think total, you know, when we're looking at data points, it's over 100,000 accounts. Um, and just quick math, 100,000 times 12 months times 10 years uh, gives you well over 12 million data points. Uh, and so right now, uh, staff is, is working on that. I've seen them working on it. I've seen some of the work product. There's a lot of data to process. Um, but I think it's very important that we take a, uh, a careful approach uh, to that first step so that we can make sure that we have the right the right uh, data uh, in place uh, so that then we can jump to the next step. Um, and, and with that, um, I'll give uh, Ben an opportunity to jump in as well. Uh, Ben's got a couple of recommendations uh, for for us um, based on on what was uh, sure. uh, spelled out in the CRI uh, audit. Right. Um, and so, Ben, I'll, I'll give and the certainly when, <clears throat> when we start looking at the uh, at the information that is presented as far as the twenty nine million dollars that are going to be applied to uh, the, the future customers and, and the accounting that goes behind it, there's certainly a lot of moving parts of money's coming in, money's going out and what remains and what what is not. Right. And so one of the things that that in, in working with with the finance committee is to determine. Um, Kind of get a, a good, strong uh, uh, arms wrapped around the entire project and see what what to ensure that the accounting number one is correct and that we have good uh, transparency and clarity over what what the numbers are. Uh, and so we've proposed uh, certain procedures to be done to a lot of those numbers. If you'd like for me, I'd go uh, kind of address some of those uh, in in our presentation. Is one is to uh, look at the rate increase fund that 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 was collected right for specifically for that project and what was the determination of 
of those amount and kind of provide an accounting of, of over time, the amounts that were designated for the Tenasco project and, and where they ended up. Secondly, is an, an, an evaluation of lost interest opportunity on, on those funds over time. Certainly, uh, some of the, those uh, funds were not put in, in effect or expended immediately. So, you certainly have the time value of money consideration with respect to those funds sitting uh, in a cash account or wherever uh, fund they would be. Um, the second would be, uh, and a lot of this work is already done, obviously, with the amount of resources that have been expended uh, uh, on this project uh, from outside parties looking in, is the verification of the accounting documentation related to all the expenditures, uh, whether they be soft costs, engineering costs, uh, or actually hard assets per purchase and then everything that has been capitalized. Uh, to some extent, uh, some of those assets still remain uh, on the books today and 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 since the project has been discarded, uh, then there needs to be given some consideration with respect to um, is there any impairment uh, on those assets that we still have? And if so, what that impairment would be. And so uh, certainly have to give consideration to that as well. Um, the one of the other uh, things that that kind of give makes us raise an eyebrow a little bit is the evaluation of methodology used to apply those um, the refunds post 20, 2016 to the rate stabilization uh, program. And so those funds uh, in, in in discussing with with the chairman here, uh, there's two separate programs, and we got the Tenasco project and we got the rate stabilization project. And so we have Tenasco project money is going into the rate stabilization project. And so we kind of want to clarify the accounting behind that and kind of bring that to light as well as uh, how how everything was accounted for. Um, certainly, when we talk about uh, uh, disposition of that twenty nine not twenty nine million dollar fund that the Tenasca Equity Fund, uh, we certainly want to give consideration with respect to. Uh, what the effect on the financial statements will be, uh, whether we will record a prior period adjustment or it would be a transfer from uh, a net position to a liability account and how that affects and the disposi overall disposition of, of that plan, plan going forward. In light of all that, in light of uh, assigning that, that fund to a liability yes. um, and also in addition with the rate reductions, and I believe you all have a budget uh, item uh, to be addressed here at the next board meeting with respect to uh, your new your your adjusted budget as a result of those rate reductions. Certainly, want to look at where your projected fund balance is going to end up at the end of the year uh, in light of that this fund and the rate reduction. So we'll be giving some consideration to that as well. I know it's 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 a lot. <laughs> it's an earful. Uh, it seems com complicated, but at the end of the day, we just want to. Uh, ensure that the accounting is adequate and appropriate and transparent and everybody's in agreement with what the numbers are uh, going forward so that we can uh, put this one to, to rest as well. So uh, that's what we're proposing. A lot of the work has been done already by, by finance staff. It's just a matter of us going alongside to determine, yes, that's right, or no, we disagree for whatever reason, if any. Uh, and so th that's really our take on uh, what we saw. At the last finance committee, uh, just really just getting ourselves comfortable that the accounting is correct and the numbers are are as they should be. And so, all right, thanks, Ben. And um, uh, Ben has put together that list of recommendations. Um, I, I'm guessing there'd be no problem with emailing those to the to the members of the finance committee so that so that everybody has them. Um, I think staff may already have those recommendations. Um, like Ben said, a lot of this information. Um, is is ready um, and the staff already has it. I, I think the objective here is to compile it, um, have it, you know, all in one place, have Ben's team uh, look at it and then come to us with a proposal uh, so that they can audit those numbers and have um, a, a perhaps a, an opinion or or a, a, you know, a, a, a review of that. Um, and ultimately, I think it's important a lot of these a lot of these items are items that have been uh, asked um, uh, about, uh, you know, by, by the public and, and by board members. So I think it'll be important uh, once we have this completed and once we have an independent third party review it, 
uh, that we have a document that can be made publicly available and uh, hopefully will uh, help uh, answer a lot of those questions that have right. been asked. Uh, and again, ensure that we have full uh, transparency uh, right. on, on all of these items. Some of these items were touched on, touched upon by the CRI mm -hmm. uh, report or were, were outside of the scope of that report. And so here, I think it's important that uh, we have a, um, uh, an external uh, auditor to, to review what's in there um, right. and, uh, and help, again, bring transparency to, to those items. Right. As you mentioned, this, this transpired over almost a 10-year ten year lifespan, and so all the information has come in disaggregated, right? And hopefully uh, this will bring a nice summary as to all the moving parts of, of of the project and where the money went, where it is, and the dis, the ultimate disposition of those funds as well. And so, uh, that is my goal, and hopefully, uh, and 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 hopefully ad address some of the gaps in in the report that that every, anybody may have questions. So, uh, to the extent that anybody has pertinent, relevant information that I should consider, um, um, my my office is always open. My phone right. is always available, and you can contact me anytime. Well, Ben, if you wouldn't mind sharing that mm -hmm. um, those recommendations with the board, mm -hmm. uh, and then you know, if any board member feels that there's uh, something that, that should be added or, or has any suggestions, then right. um, I'm, I'm assuming they can they can contact you or, or respond to that email and, and provide board Absolutely. input. Any any questions, uh, Joseph or Art? A minor one. Um, some of what you're suggesting, which is uh, very good, like necessary, the figuring out the disposition of these funds and, and you know, um, wasn't that actually in the initial scope of work for the CRI audit? I, I don't know. I mean, obviously, we, we weren't the client there. Um, and. And so uh, I, the, that report was a was a forensic audit, but it, it wasn't a, a financial audit. And so I think here the objective is to be able to to have our auditors take a look at it and and determine uh, not only provide transparency, but also determine if any adjustments uh, have to be made to our uh, financials, um, you know, either prior year, current year, or or future uh, uh, fiscal year. Okay, okay. Um, and, and just so you know, it's uh, objective four, determine the amount and disposition of any funds raised or collected in furtherance of the project. Um, so anyways, yes. Okay, I, I am on board with it. Uh, just a little disappointed uh, that we didn't get that with, with this other audit, but yes. Just real quick for clarification, anyone can provide this to me. The um, the rate payers that were paid into Tanaska, that was based on electrical consumption only? That's correct. Mm -hmm. So the return will be only on those clients, customers that um, we analyze their consumption during that period. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then people are asking, uh, wait a minute, you know, they owe me X amount. But um, at the same time, we were, we were um, investing or we were paying into the rate stability funds were, were, were we also still collecting money from ratepayers at the same time post 2016 i'm sorry i didn't understand the question i'll speak to mike 2016 we had rate stabilization we had funds moving from the tanaska funds did we still have ratepayers paying into tanaska yes we we're still collecting from the rate increases from tanaska and they were all being funneled through and then being the reduction program well, and that, that's kind and of that's been, that's that's been quite, be tricky, right? right? Well, and that's and that's why I think it's important to have a uh, an independent third party right. auditor take a look at that and, and, and issue. Well, public, it's difficult to yeah. transfer to a, right. And so you have two different programs, uh, two yes, funds, yes. if you will, and you're you're bringing from from one to another. Right. I just want to make sure that the account yeah, is correct. The main point is. Clients and customers are going to want to understand is it's only based on uh, the consumption of energy and electricity. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. And so we'll be we'll be looking at all the drivers of that. 
you know, the drivers of the rate increases, the drive, you know, identification of how was that segregated, uh, and the and and the criteria used to okay, these are the Nasca funds. Looking at all the pieces. at some point, the public. Any member of the public can, can read the report. Say, oh, well, yeah, I, yeah, that makes and sense. I, I think based on you know electrical consumption. The the objective here, I think, is not only to put all this information together, which I think staff already has most of it, if not all of it. Um, but not not only that, put it all together uh, in a way that that um, is easy to to work through, and then on top of that, make sure that it's independently reviewed. Um, you know, and, and verified, and we have an opinion uh, from an independent third party, um, which in this case uh, would be our external auditors. Okay, thank and, you. And along the way, there was approvals by the, I, I believe, the, the board at the time for whatever transfer were made, and so we'll be looking at all those as well. Everything. Ticking and tying and, and ensuring that, that everything was in place. Worked out all the math. Thank yeah. you. Any other questions for, for Ben on that item? Nope. All right. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. Um, all right. So we're, we are at 1242. Um, again, I think we've got a, a hard exit um, in about 10 minutes, 13 minutes. Um, so we'll, we, we may not have enough time to go into um, to look at the closed meeting items. Um, so at, at this point, we'll jump into seven and eight. Uh, and just be be conscious of that because I my understanding would be that once we lose uh, Mr. Rondon um, at that point we'd have to adjourn the meeting correct yeah okay so we've got do you think twelve minutes is enough Marilyn to look at the six or seven and eight in in open session probably not but we can try as much as we can accomplish you know so at least we can uh, do seven um, eight maybe a little bit more uh, on there so we'll do what we can okay. Well, that's that's how much time we have. Okay, so we'll start with item number seven. Uh, we have uh, um, Lina Alvarez, our current energy risk uh, manager, and she will be presenting our status. That one will be quick, and we also have Mr. Glenn Justice on the line, I believe, um, and with experience on demand, and he is uh, going to be also assisting um, Cassandra and Ray on item number eight. Okay. Um, good afternoon. My name is Lina Alvarez, and I am Bronzeville Pub's uh, energy risk manager. Hey, Lina. Um, today, I will be presenting uh, the gas hedging strategy update. Um, since the prior finance committee meeting, we held additional internal discussions on the feasibility of the gas hedging strategy. Uh, the outcome has been positive. We're pretty excited about this new hedging program. And we do have a few uh, more steps to be completed prior to moving forward, but we're working on that. Um, during this presentation, we will be providing a brief update on the project. Um, as a recap from the prior finance committee meeting, the purpose of the program will be to reduce the impact of fuel price volatility uh, on BPUB's energy cost. By using financial, financial contracts, we can effectively lock in the price for a portion of our gas requirements on a month-to-month -month basis. Um, when done properly, the cash flows uh, from the financial contracts will largely offset the cost of the, cons of the fuel consumed at Hidalgo and Silas Ray um, to create more predictable fuel costs. That's the plan. Uh, next, we will review the, the near-term timeline. We will start from the bottom uh, to the top. Give me one second. I think I forgot to open my... There it is. There it is. Okay, so um, first we have given ourselves uh, the, month, the month of November to clarify the accounting and disclosure requirements. We held an internal meeting on operating procedures and transaction processing. We also discussed near-term disclosure requirements and held a meeting with Mike Perez and Monica Cavazos on hedging and financial statement treatment. And at this point, they're comfortable with it. They do not see a problem moving forward with the project. Mm -hmm. um, second, uh, the second bar is uh, the ISTA agreement. ISTA stands for International Swaps and Derivatives Association. Um, the ISTA agreement is a contract that enables and governs the execution of the hedging transaction. This ISTA agreement does not obligate BPV to engage into any particular transaction but it does enable the opportunity to be able to have that um, 
those transactions. The ISA is at this time in progress, and the plan is to have at least one ISTA in place by December 2022 so that we can do a pilot program coming January and or February 2023. Um, the third bar is the, uh, this next bar is the design of the pilot program uh, to test and evaluate the fuel price hedging on a small scale. We anticipate designing, finalizing, and preparing for approval um, as mentioned by December uh, 2022 so that we can roll our program coming January and or February 2023. Okay. Um, we're finalizing a procedure also that includes uh, more detail as to the methods, the products, and the responsibilities associated with the fuel hedging strategy. Uh, also, prior models that we have developed to evaluate the potential benefits and cost and risk associated with uh, fuel price hedging will be updated to reflect new cost and, and uh, updated model, uh, updated system. This model will be used to determine the proposed hedging quantity for the pilot program. That's the plan. Then the fourth part, once the pilot program has been in place uh, for a month or two, we plan to evaluate the results mm -hmm. of, of the pilot program. This evaluation is to be completed by March, 2023. And the next and last part is to present the pilot program results to the board and to the finance committee meet, uh, group. Uh, besides following this timeline that we presented, we are developing metrics and reporting methods um, to be able to provide the cost benefit analyses and, and be able to report it on a regular basis. Great. Um, that's my brief update. If there's any questions, I'll be happy to well, answer. I, what I would say, Lena, is I'm, I'm, I like your timeline. Um, I, I hope that we're able to have something in place like you have here on your timeline for, for Q3 uh, and then especially for Q4 when our uh, consumption spikes, right? Um, right. Because that's that's typically when we see the, the highest consumption. And and so hopefully um, we'll see some some positive results and, and have enough data uh, by the end of, of Q2 uh, so that we can have a, a meaningful, again, continuation of the pilot program into Q3. And, and I just, I would leave that have that in the back of your mind. Um, I think uh, you know the the community could really benefit uh, from uh, an actionable program uh, by Q4. That's um, right. You know, as as we go into our summer months and and we see cons consumption spike, um, you know, as it has historically. So yeah, right. I think you you've got a good timeline. Let us know what we can do to to help you guys stay on schedule and and uh, put together a, a good program for. Our customer. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We're excited to to start this program. That's great. So much for chair. Joseph or, or Art, any any questions? No. No, I'm I'm excited to see how this works out too. All right. So, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to say this is a two part presentation. The first part was on the guest uh, hedging strategy, and the second one was on power supply. Yep. And for that, I know that Lena and uh, Mr. Glenn Justice are both are going to be tag teaming this one. We'll try and get it within the next 10 minutes, but it is extensive and it is uh, the information if that is inf information, is, it's yeah. important. All right. Well, we have, we have 10 minutes mm -hmm. exactly. So, um, let, let's, let's work on that. Let's go ahead and jump to number eight then. It's actually still number seven. Oh, this is the first part was a gas oh, hedging strategy. Right. Right. Was power okay. supply? Power supply. Okay. Correct. Yep. I'll change the slides for you, Glenn. Go ahead. Okay. Very good. Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you, Glenn. Good. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks very much for the opportunity to present. Uh, my name is Glenn Justice. I'm a senior partner, Experience on Demand, um, and I had the opportunity to. Speak with you uh, at the last meeting with more information about the gas hedging program. Uh, I do understand we have pretty limited time, so I'm just going to jump into this and cover a couple of the key slides. Uh, but we we wanted to shift our attention now to power supply and what we're doing on um, on thinking about future resource options for for Brownsville PUB. Uh, so, Lena, if you could if you could uh, jump down uh, to um, next slide, please. One more, please. 
background? Yeah, yes, thank you. So, um, you know, we're, we're obviously aware of the ongoing controversy regarding the CRI report, but ir irrespective of that, uh, Brownsville PUB has an obligation to plan for future resources to provide reliable and economic electric power service. And the purpose of this information is to give you a preliminary view of an optimal resource plan for PUB to support further discussion. So, uh, I'll, I'll kind of jump to the punchline. We, we developed a, a preliminary resource plan, which we think has, has, um, you know, attractive economic characteristics. And what we're doing next is engaging in some internal workshops, bringing a day together. A wide variety of personnel within a Brownsville PUB to talk through those options and to further analyze them to come up with a definitive power supply strategy uh, by Q1 of next year. Now, when we uh, refer to the word optimal, uh, we, we, and we, I, I try to be careful with these terms from a technical perspective. Optimal in this case means the lowest cost, but within a set of constraints and policies. So it's not necessarily absolute lowest cost uh, because you have other other factors that that uh, you know play into this. But uh, examples of the constraints uh, include things like sufficient resources to meet reasonably projected potential peak load, uh, and and as it turns out, you actually have a a, a policy requirement in your energy risk management policy to plan for su sufficient resources to at least meet um, peak load levels. Uh, you also may have a constraint and have a preference to maintain, maintain some level of local generation. Uh, that makes a lot of sense for various reasons. And of course, uh, like any uh, capital investment and energy commodity uh, set of considerations, you 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 almost always want to maintain a diverse resource portfolio so that the utility is not unduly exposed to production or cost volatility of any single uh, resource type. So, you know, quite simply, you, don't, you want, don't want to have all your eggs in one basket in terms of your, your uh, power supply resources. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we, we've been actually working on this since 2019. So in 2019, a load forecast was prepared by CDG engineers that then fed into a 2020 resource plan. That plan was then updated and presented to the board in 2021. Uh, the key recommendation there was to issue an RFP for the purposes of obtaining more specific pricing on a diverse assortment of resource options. Uh, and now, uh, as I mentioned before, we're updating the resource planning models and preparing a preliminary uh, plan for further discussion, uh, some of which is uh, described herein in terms of the results. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is a, a really important slide and I want to cover this for just a moment. Uh, any uh, utility resource planning effort starts with a, a forecast of, of average and peak load. And this is a, a pictorial of the historical peak load and then what we're assuming for the different scenarios going forward. And it's been a particularly difficult environment to plan in. If you look at the, the load pattern and the peak load data, uh, in the 1990s and up through roughly 2010, you had really pretty rapid load growth. And that, and in fact, that load growth uh, data uh, directly contributed to the resource planning efforts back in 2010 and 2011 associated with the Tanaska plan. Now, since then, uh, we've had a, a very clear flattening of load, but interspersed in that period between 2010 and 2020, there's been these periods where load kind of spikes up a little bit uh, as related to, um, you know, unusually warm or in, in some cases cold uh, uh, weather during those particular years. But it's continued to fluctuate around quite a bit um, and it makes it difficult to know exactly what future load will be. So consistent with best practices, we've envisioned three different scenarios. One would be 0% load growth, 1% load growth, and 2% load growth that are all being incorporated into our resource planning activities going forward. So if you take that data, this red line represents the middle case, the 1% annual load growth assumption, and you then compare that against what resources PUV currently has. And these resources are being uh, accredited with capacity levels consistent with the way ERCOT does it. So all of your thermal generation, meaning Hidalgo and Silas Ray, as well as some of your contracts, effectively receive full credit because they're controllable generation. Uh, and you can reliably uh, exercise those uh, those resources at their maximum capacity levels. However, uh, PUB has, has, has significant uh, renewable, uh, and in this case, uh, wind resources, which actually only receive approximately 22% credit from ERCOT 
as it relates to capacity. And that's because at time of peak, typically you have less wind and those resources are operating at much lower levels of output than they would on average. When you, when you look at this picture, we actually have a short position beginning in 2023 compared to our peak load obligation. And that, uh, that position actually uh, becomes uh, shorter uh, in, in more of a deficit condition uh, in future years. In 2025, we assume that Silas Ray Unit 6, which is quite old, uh, is decommissioned. And then uh, beginning in 2030, uh, you lose some existing contracts with AEP. Now, those certainly have the opportunity to maybe be renewed if that's the right economic choice, uh, but that has not been done yet. And then later on, we would assume there's retirement of uh, Silas Ray uh, Unit 9 and Unit 10. And so we do have a significant capacity deficit we need to fill. Uh, it's really important to understand this is more of an economic issue than a reliability issue, and that's because ERCOT is responsible for resource planning uh, across the grid. And um, just because a utility might be short in any given day, doesn't mean they have to shed load. Um, load shedding only occurs on a, on a system-wide basis, which is what we saw during Winter Storm Uri in uh, 2021. Uh, so it's important to understand that the, the power flows uh, kind of no matter what, um, as long as there are sufficient resources across the entirety of the ERCOT grid. It's really an issue of how much cost risk do you want to be exposed to by having uh, insufficient resources during those, uh, those um, periods of time. Um, so, uh, unit six has limited lifespan, even if major investments are being made, unit nine is in pretty good shape overall, but it's aging. And we have these assumed retirement dates for analysis purposes. Um, we're not going to go into this in detail, but these kind of assumptions are being made as part of the resource planning effort. Uh, next slide. We also have to make a certain assumptions on capital investments. And one of the major issues we're facing relates to unit six. That unit, which has been highly unreliable for the last year or two, requires significant capital investment if we were to want to run it reliably for the next five to 10 years. And Black and & Beach actually did a study in 2019, uh, which provided them a lot of uh, valuable information on those potential capital investments. As you can see for Unit 6, we have some front-loaded investments um, in uh, 24 through 26, which will be required if we don't otherwise allow Unit 6 to retire. And so the, the basic question is, does it make sense to invest in Unit 6 and Unit 9, uh, or are we better off allowing those units to gradually be retired and just kind of you know, minimize the capital investment and instead pursue other newer resources that have a much longer lifespan and lower overall uh, operating costs? Uh, the responses to the RFP are shown on the next two slides. We've blacked out the pricing for, um, you know, confidentiality purposes, but we did receive a wide variety of options. The ones we felt were um, reasonable and 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 uh, conforming to the RFP were the ones that were that had boxes around them. But ultimately, this relates this, this summarizes or or leads to this following short list of options that we're currently considering. Uh, company E provided an attractive on-peak contract that would allow us to shore up this near-term uh, shortage um, of resources compared to uh, the peak load requirement. Uh, uh, company B, this was a, a product that related to an existing facility that was uh, responsive to the RFP and potentially attractive. Um, it was basically a heat rate type contract that would look like a generation plant that would operate under natural gas uh, 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 requirements. Uh, option C and F, uh, these were new generation that would be installed at the Silas Ridge facility, one of which was an LM6000. That was a relatively larger piece of generation that would be installed, a little bit more than we, you actually need in, in the near term. Um, then we have reciprocating engines, which are smaller modular units, which are very attractive. They're very efficient, and you can obtain them in small pieces. And then we also included some solar plus battery storage options to round out the analysis uh, that we're currently doing for the, for the preliminary plan. Um, this graphic has some preliminary calculations based on what's called levelized cost of energy analysis. I'm not going to go into this in detail, but it basically takes all of the future capital and O&M costs and divides by the number of megawatt hours across the lifespan of the units. As you can see here, Unit 6 in particular 
When you consider all of those costs, and yet the still limited lifespan is very expensive compared to the other alternatives. And for that reason, we currently believe it does not make sense to make major incremental investments in Silas Ray Unit 6. So then the question becomes, well, what do we do instead of that? Um, next slide, please. Um, and this graphic it actually shows across different scenarios. And these are scenarios for high prices, low prices, a high load and low load, and these occur in pairs. So you can see each pair of columns is with and without the investment in Silas Ray Unit 6. Only in the high load case, which is the second pair of columns, so this would be the third and fourth uh, set of columns over, does it make sense to invest in Unit 6? And we certainly do not believe it's likely that PUB would transition back into a high load growth scenario based on the data we've seen so far. So the, the, the bottom line of this graph, it kind of helps to, to demonstrate that under various scenarios, under most of these, it makes sense to allow Unit 6 to retire compared to other alternatives. Next graph, please. So the draft expansion plan that currently um, we think makes the most sense is first of all, to minimize uh, the uh, Silas Ray 6 investments to pursue this on peak contract that was proposed. Um, this would be a, a five to 10 year contract for 10 to 30 megawatts at a fixed price during the on peak hours. We think that is a, a fairly priced contract and would help to shore up the resources um, and that you know, subject to further, uh, further analysis. We think the smaller reciprocating engines are very attractive. Uh, so in the near term, in the 2024 and 2025 time, uh, 2025 time frame, we would basically be replacing unit six with one or two small reciprocating engines. And that facility would be built out in a way that would allow for additional reciprocating engines to be easily added at a relatively attractive cost. Uh, but then when we get up into the 2030 period, then uh, based on the retirement of uh, unit, unit nine, as well as uh, the the drop off of the AEP contracts, then we would be uh, potentially needing larger chunks of generation, which would be best served through LM6000 uh, combustion turbine uh, resources. Thank you. Uh, Glenn, I, I apologize. I, I don't mean to interrupt you guys, uh, but at this time, uh, we do have a board member that's here present that, that has a um, a uh, scheduling con conflict and, and has to uh, leave the meeting. Um, so I, my understanding is that we don't have uh, any options other than to uh, uh, end the meeting. Okay. Uh, if you're available, uh, if you're available, we may be able to set up a uh, a call uh, off meeting uh, to go through a, a couple of questions. But at this this time, we need to uh, adjourn the the meeting. Uh, Very good. Thank you. I apologize. I wish there was a way that we can bring it back for a brief, uh, you know, it would require another 30 minutes, 45 minutes. Yeah, I, I think we will. I think this is a priority uh, for the finance committee and it's something that we're going to be uh, continuing to look at uh, from now until we've got, um, you know, that pilot program and then a, a, a mm -hmm. program that's that's ready for full implementation. So yeah. we'll, we can call another meeting um, later this month uh, to, to follow up on these items. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you, you guys. Um, so at this time, we're, we're going to leave uh, item eight pending um, and the closed item, um, the closed meeting items pending as well. Uh, we do have discussion and possible recommendations on, on um, closed meeting items, which won't be addressed. Uh, re discussion and request for future agenda items. Uh, like Mr. Rondona said, um, it, it'd be nice to be able to, to continue this conversation and continue getting posted on it. So. We'll look at a couple of dates and see if we can call something either next week or the following week uh, to address some of these items based on on uh, what information we have from staff. Now there are a couple of items that can be recommended for the meeting on uh, Monday. Um, well, yeah, yeah. So th those items are already on the on the agenda, so they don't they don't need any action. Okay. All right, all right. So. Um, Everybody who's here, Glenn, thanks for being on the call. Joseph, uh, staff, thanks for being here. Um, a lot of great information presented today. I really appreciate that. Um, at this time, 1.05 p.m., uh, we will adjourn the Finance Committee meeting. Thank you. Thank you. All. <laughs> Thank you.